There's no Tetris mode, I think. No Tetris, no. no. That feels like a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Man, to see for you, yeah. I'm taking it from you. Hi, I'm Charlie. This is Oz. Hey, I'm Lauren. This is the Escaping Web Podcast. This is the intro to the Escaping Web Podcast. <laughs> Lauren, what's your last name? <laughs> just this last name. Just your last name. The Doric. Great. Um, state your name and occupation. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Lauren Bedoric and I work at Figma. Great. I'm a graphics engineer at Figma. Nice. Yeah, we want to just hear about you. Most of the other guests I've like met before at some yeah. point, so I don't know anything. I tried to do a little uh, Twitter search and stuff, and I saw that you made some like sad face crying today with tears or a couple days ago. You animated something oh, with I tears. Oh, I did. Yeah, that's like two months ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So what? What? What was that? What was this? <laughs> <laughs> it seems um, like your job is making animations of crying emoji faces. That is not quite my job, but it's sometimes my job. Okay. Um, my job is to make uh, like a renderer that animates things generally. So in making bug reports, it's sometimes fun to make like a crying sad face yeah. emoji. Um, that was a feature we're working on like animated GIF support. And there's a um, like a scrubber that we added so you can choose which GIF is showing on the main canvas outside of like animation mode. And that required like understanding the GIF spec to understand like how they're encoded. Mm-hmm. So you can't actually like you can't really step backwards in a GIF. Um, so that particular bug was that if you step backwards, it like keeps the tears around. Uh, and so I made a cool crying emoji. <laughs> nice. Okay. So it is yeah. pronounced GIF then. Important. No, it's actually pronounced GIF, That's but I call it GIF because okay. I I just do. <laughs> but actually, there's this like famous or like famous quote unquote. Um, old GIF from 1989, which is when the second GIF spec was introduced, the GIF 89 spec. And the guy who wrote it, this guy Bob, like made this example GIF to, GIF, GIF, to show all the features of GIF 89. And one of them is like, I can't remember exactly. There's like several that are related to animation. And the one is like, you can embed comments in the GIF. Okay. Like there's a, there's a field in the GIF spec for comments that are just like hidden and never rendered. There's like a okay. special field for this. In the, um, this is if you're like artisanally hand crafting the GIF. Yeah, frame exactly. by frame. Yeah. And so I think the comment in this GIF says like, oh, so there's comments and then there's also text as a feature. Okay. So like there's a field in the GIF spec where you're supposed to like write text and then like say how to render it, but like it's not in pixels, it's just in text. Okay. And so he has this text in the GIF that says like, these are the cool new features of GIF 89 and also like it's pronounced GIF. Um, but there's basically nowhere you can see that GIF rendered correctly because no browsers implement those features. There you go. Well, yeah. maybe that's why we can pronounce it. Probably. How, how did you find that out? I mean, you're deep in, you're deep oh, yeah. in GIFs right now. Uh, not anymore, but We're I just going to keep like alternating between GIF and GIF. <laughs> two months That's ago. so annoying. <laughs> it's frustrating because I know I'm wrong, but I refuse to say GIF. Yeah. Um, yeah, two months ago I was deep in GIFs. Just like trying to Trying to figure out all the bugs because we like had to write a GIF decoder and a uh, render so to like understand the GIF spec yeah. and then decide which of the features will implement, which is like same as browsers. So who's we at this point? You should tell us. We I work at Figma, which is a design tool, so it's a competitor to like uh, Sketch and Adobe XD and those kinds of of things. So you can make design files for like. Uh, user interface design generally, but people use it for all kinds of stuff. And so there's like a, like the main part of the tool is kind of the, the canvas where you like edit design files and stuff. And then there's another feature where you can like quick play and view your designs in um, like presentation mode. It's like in a, in device frames or like a slideshow or whatever. And so that's a secondary render that my team builds. I, I heard that this is taking the world. I, heard that <laughs> I hope so. You'd be crazy to use another design tool. Yeah, this. I hope so. I need stock options, so that'd be great. <laughs> uh, why, why do you think this is? Why are you guys seeing so much? Uh, it seems like success, right? A lot of adoption. Yeah, so our, like, the the first kind of version that ever came out, the, the differentiator was that it's all in the browser and it's collaborative, so it's like, you know, Google Docs for design files. 
so it's um, you can see other people editing and like in real time, just in real like time. yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's really collaborative. Teams like it because then a designer can be designing stuff, and then a copywriter can also be like editing copy at the same time. And like a project manager can be in there and um, all kinds of stuff. Do people actually do that? Is it is it that yeah really they do okay yeah it's pretty cool just to like hear how excited our customers are that um, you know because otherwise I think you like the design team has stuff and they like version stuff they're like v1 finish like v2 v2 dot a v2 dot a3 and then they like send it to their copywriters and the copywriters are changing things and they like send it back and so that's kind of crazy so you can do everything in the same file oh yeah I get the same file thing I was just wondering at the same time like almost like yeah I mean I don't think anyone well I could be wrong but I don't imagine that anyone is like designing the first version and copy it and having sometime. the product manager review it but there are definitely that. like a lot of teams have just gigantic files so like you could be like way over here in a file and then like your copywriters way over here and totally. you're editing components like style components and stuff and then they're editing copy this is completely random but um google docs have you seen this writer taylor lorenz on twitter she, oh, no. she covers like weird trends from tweens and millennials and do mm-hmm. have you seen her stuff yeah and she she had one thing where it was like Google Docs is the new social network. And I don't know, because they use it at school, maybe people are just like, like kids, like sending notes to each other. And like, that's the thing. Yeah. Which is quick. So maybe Figma, if people, if it wasn't could, expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't know our exact price and model. It's like free up to a certain number of editors. It's like okay. three editors or something. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just saying it has social virality yeah. potential. <laughs> it makes sense. Cause then you can communicate as a teenager by making gifts, just for one another. Yeah. Making memes and stuff. Yeah. And okay. like saying that you're doing your design project, but actually you're just talking to your friends, I guess. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. But that's people make all kinds of like fun, like weird games and stuff. Um, we just launched plugins, so now there's like like programmable design files, basically. So people, like someone I saw on Twitter the other day launched like a, a plugin for Pong in Figma. So there's like code running that like does the stuff, and the person on each side can move the, the Pong thing. That's sweet. Yeah. Were you a Figma lot like user before this, before joining? Um, I'm not a designer, so okay. I had used it a couple times actually. Like my, at one point at my last job, which was at Mapbox, um, I was on a team that was building like, actually, incidentally, we were building a like, map design studio. So I worked on a couple different design tools, mm-hmm. um, but that team there was no designer on the team specifically. It was like three sort of like, engineers who were designing everything. So we heard about Figma in 2015, and I I signed up for the beta then, and so I like got into it, and I thought it was cool, but I wasn't also building websites, so I didn't really, yeah. didn't really use it too much, but I was familiar, and I thought it was a pretty cool technology. Um, and the Figma engineering blog is pretty good, and so yeah, I like, read, read some things and thought it was pretty cool, and then heard from them and was interested. So one thing that um, we're interested in on this podcast, as in something that Charlie and I chat about is um, the possibility that all of the front end engineers that uh, you know, have made it into the industry and are doing good work could experience a kind of shock uh, where there's a platform shift, a new technology shows up, and all of a sudden, a lot of the somewhat repetitive routine work that you're doing as a, as a front end developer uh, changes dramatically, maybe even disappears. Is this something that you guys have a bird's eye view on? Do you feel like the way that uh, people are using Figma for design is affecting how people do front end work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we definitely try to make like developer handoff easy. So, uh, but it's pretty platform agnostic, right? So, like you can see the designs, and then you also see like what CSS things correspond to. But I don't think that there is really an answer for like, like are you saying that if React dies or something, and then everybody has to learn a whole new framework. Or... I mean, that's that's a thing, but uh, I'm more curious about like okay, well, even that. Like code less so yeah, oh. you're um, you're designing as a designer, and uh, handoff previously would be well, you get this PSD, and then the front end uh, engineer, uh, quote unquote, uh, is slicing up the PSD into making the doing the box and, model on their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas you guys are emitting the CSS that the design corresponds to. And this is not something that Photoshop can do because that's not the basis of the, those aren't the primitives mm-hmm. of Photoshop. Uh, and it seems like Sketch was 
starting to push in that direction and thinking about compliance and so on, but then Freedom is a new opportunity to think about like skipping a couple of the steps of web development. Yeah. Um, as a person who like has never done developer handoff or like much front end work, <laughs> I, I actually don't really know the answer to this question, but um, we'll have to yeah, wait and see. Kind of I mean, I could totally see that happen. Like in my last company, we were doing a lot of content marketing to try to um, get people excited about deep learning. And one of the things that got tons of interest was uh, design mockups to HTML code. And even if it was, it was like the like very, using a neural net for that. Using a neural net, it was like very simple, <laughs> uh, and it made this sort of clickable thing. And people went nuts. And they went nuts because this is great. This solves all my problems. But then I think a lot of people are like, even the engineers aren't safe <laughs> from automation. Yeah. But I, even in some respect, like like the clickable mockups that a non-engineer can now do in something like a Figma, it's pretty sweet that you can have like a working demo just yeah. from like files alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've seen people suggest like on Twitter and stuff, like most people could make a like a prototype in Figma and then just like send people that link and they would never know that it's not like the real website. Yeah. Uh, which is their goal because I'm on that team as part of the future. When you got hired to figure out where you hired to like Lauren's coming in to solve this problem, go like did you know what team you were joining? Like what was that whole thing like? No, definitely not. Um, I was not hired to solve a problem. Okay. I actually like uh, so for the last two and a half years, I was in Mapbox, uh, which is like the majority of the time, the time I was there, I was working on the map rendering engine. Um, so I knew I wanted to do graphics work still. I really liked really like that more than anything else I'd done and so I was like pretty picky about where I would go next and I knew that Figma had a lot of interesting graphics work and then I joined and I was actually like sort of put on a not not super graphics team and it was more of like a front end team and I was like felt totally lost I was like as a person with four years of experience I feel like an idiot because I like don't know these react things and stuff and um thankfully everyone there, everyone there was really good and um my manager like knew I wasn't happy and found a graphics team for me to be on and help facilitate that. Yeah. 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 That's like, I think as, cause I'm kind of, that's like similar. I'm in my third engineering role having come out of a boot camp, and I'm, I'd love to be in a position. I don't, maybe this is like a made up reality where like I'm being hired to like solve a specific thing. And I know exactly the team I'm on, even in my current place, I thought I was being hired. I'm working at cruise now. I thought I was being hired to, because I had this deep learning platform experience to join the MLP team, and I get in, and I'm on an entirely different team, uh, which is fine. It's super cool. I've learned a ton about that. But it'd be it's interesting to think as you like get mid to senior level as an engineer, like you're kind of like having more say in like the things you're working on. And it's cool that you found graphics as this thing that I want to dig in and get better at and focus on. Yeah, I definitely. I don't anticipate like taking the next job that's not in graphics. Yeah. Um, and I get a lot of like inbound recruiter emails and like only a few of them are, in, are even relevant in graphics, but I feel like they're enough that, um, yeah, I think I could, I think I could pick the next job that like wants me for, for graphics it's when the time's right, which yeah. is not anytime soon. Yeah. So how did you break in in the first place? Because typically when you see people working on graphics, they like have some graduate experience in graphics, uh, maybe like a lifelong interest from implementing little games or uh, you know, working on graphics as a, as a teenager. Uh, tell us about your early journey. Yeah, I got to graphics totally by accident. Um, I was at Mapbox and I was just hired like when it was a pretty small company to be, uh, actually it was like before there were really teams or projects. So it was kind of like you worked on whatever someone suggests that you like try next. Um, so I worked on a lot of different things that I worked on. Um, actually when I started briefly the graphics team, but I had no idea what I was doing, they were like, don't you see the triangles? And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> Nothing here looks like a triangle. Um, and then I, but that was my first engineering job. And then I worked on, um, let's see, in order, I can't remember. But at some point I worked on routing, like our, our map routing engine. And I worked on um, building this uh, map style authoring tool. It was like sort of a, a full stack project. And then um, I think while I was on the routing team, I felt super lost on that team because everybody who works on map routing has like definitely PhDs in in like graph theory and stuff from this one university in Germany. They like they very specialize, specialized. Yeah. So I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and our CTO was like, hey, we have this project that someone should take on on the rendering team. Do you want to do that? 
like, do you want to implement 3D buildings on maps? And I was like, I have no idea how to do that, but sure. Um, and it was that kind of company where you didn't really need a lot of experience and people trust you to learn stuff and dig in. So I felt really lucky there. And I worked on that first project and it was like with a lot of guidance from another engineer in the team and um, found that I really liked it. And I actually, um, I came to coding also from a boot camp mm-hmm. into hack rate. And before that I had uh, studied, I double majored in college in public policy and art. So I had like an art background, but I also like grew up being a super mathy kid. So graphics made a lot of sense to me. And that was like very visual, but also very mathematical. And um, yeah, I decided to try to dig in further. But I definitely feel like compared with uh, most graphics engineers in the industry, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like I couldn't yeah. make like a complex 3D game world. I've actually only worked mostly in like 2D graphics. So uh, I speak to a lot of engineers. Maybe this is a kind of selection bias as well. But I speak to a lot of junior, mid-level engineers who are super bored of web development are at companies that are doing more interesting things than that, but find it challenging to transition from their role to another. What do you think was special about Mapbox that allowed you and presumably others to, to do that? Um, yeah, so Mapbox was like pretty unique in that it was founded... Uh, it was spun out of a another company that was like a, an agency doing public sector development work. It was started by people who also had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> so <laughs> there was like a designer and developer, but they like they didn't have those backgrounds either. I think they both had international development backgrounds and they kind of like figured out computers and then were building websites for um, like government agencies and nonprofits. And then like uh, they were working on a on a project doing. Um, open election mapping for the first like uh, democratic elections in Afghan- Afghanistan okay. and they needed a map platform that would like change fast enough to reflect the changing um, political geography there and that wasn't the case in any like Google Maps or anything so they found this like open source map database which is OpenStreetMap and built their own renderer and found out that was fun and like spun it into a company but so like the, the roots of that company are in people not knowing what they're doing and just like learning along the way and like our CTO was um, also, he started at, at Mapbox's parent company as a design intern, so hmm. everyone knows oh <laughs> everyone was like that. Very scrappy. It was yeah. pretty cool, and so they, they really trusted you to kind of try stuff, and yeah, it was, I got lucky, and that is just that kind of place. Um, How big was it when you joined? How many people? Uh, it was about 50 when I joined. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting, because eventually it sounds like once you found this, like stumbled upon this German university, you started hiring people who are like hyper focused and specialized and really good at this, but it still was able to maintain the like flexibility of like, Oh, we're going to throw a smart person at this problem. Uh, yeah. The German the university thing is specifically for routing. So that was like just okay. a couple people in okay. like our small routing team. Um, but yeah, generally they, they hired people from boot camps and from like random, like hipster DC places. Cause it was based in DC and, um, just like top people out of code. Yeah. Gave them jobs. That's sweet. Yeah. Is your story typical? Were there a lot of people who are moving around, being given more responsibility than they necessarily had a background for? Um, so it was the kind of place where uh, I think this probably happens in a lot of companies where, like, for a long time in our growth period from like small to medium small, it was like musical chairs and you could like move around as much as you want. And then at some point, you decide that you need to be like a grown up company and have like managers and team structure and everybody has to sit down and so like if you were there before that then you got to kind of try everything um and then i happened to be on the right team when like everybody had to sit down um okay so it it, like it formalized itself yeah it's it's a lot more formal now so now people who join will get like a much more specific team assignment and it's it's harder to move as is i think at every company that has like any kind of management structure was there a particular precipitating event or a particular uh, size or something that you were at when that happened? Like how, how from the outside do I judge whether I'm walking into a situation where I can be, where the music's playing or not in this situation? This is so crazy, but Mapbox didn't have managers until 220 people. Okay. So, <laughs> so in that case, the music is still playing, but also that's like, that kind of worked up until like a hundred people. And then after that. Did the everyone report to the CTO? No one reported to anyone. There was, like, not a manager. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to explain that in a way that doesn't sound terrible. Yeah. It, like, kind of worked fine for a while until it didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't have a manager until 
two and a half years in the river shed. And then was there a breaking point in Tennessee? It was like, all right, we go from... I think for a little while, people realized that, that things were kind of falling through. But like anyone who joined after 100 people felt sort of lost. And like I joined before that, obviously, and um, at a point where everybody knew everybody and like I often felt like I didn't know what I was doing, but like the CTO cared about me and like everybody else cared and so you kind of ask anybody to help. And then once it gets too big, it's, it's hard to maintain that. I think it changes once it switches from first name only emails to first name dot last name emails. Yeah. Like, you know, if you, they're that strict cut off, like you're not in the old guard, uh, like you're second class citizen. It's, yeah, totally. I've, I've felt that a couple of times. And like when I come in, I can get Charlie at, I'm like, yes. Are you Charlie at Cruz? I'm Charlie.Harrington at Cruz. And oh. I think you can uh, infer my hierarchy based on that. Yeah. yeah it's Lauren in Mapbox and Lauren at Figma. Lauren's sad. common too. I'm surprised there's, yeah. is there a new Lauren now at Figma that is not really yet. pissed at you? Not yet. Okay. But there was eventually another Lauren B at Mapbox. Um, yeah, she had first name last name. That's when you knew it was time to leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's another Lauren B and she was accounting or something. Uh, something else you said was making me think like, as you're moving around and you find these things where like, I have no idea what I'm doing. There's like that moment of like fear and in, like, you know, for me, it's like uh, the imposter thing, but then you find that those are like really good. And I wonder if there's some way to know when I don't know what I'm doing, that's like the best possible place for me to be in. I guess not every time, but like seeking out those moments of like, holy shit. So that that's how you discovered graphics, for example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like both not knowing what you're doing, but also knowing that you're supported and not knowing like there's someone there yeah. who will who like believes in you and will help you. Um, I think if you felt like you didn't know what you're doing and also you didn't know who to ask and like they didn't know that you didn't know what you're doing, then that'd be scary. I think it's helpful to know that somebody else knows you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So I'm trying to build up a set of heuristics for identifying a company that would give people this kind of opportunity. <laughs> so far, I have uh, first name, email address. Yes. Yeah. Um, no managers. Is that no one? Managers. Yeah. The, the founders should have no pedigree. <laughs> uh, they, should, yeah, they should have no idea what they're doing. Um, what else did we... Oh, it, it should be a, a spin-off of some other company. Spin-off of something yeah. else. Yeah, yeah founded on accident. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right. so like a very, This is very basically the opposite of the kind of company that an investor would invest in. Totally, yeah. For, and for a while, that company was um, bootstrapped during the, the time when no one knew, knew what they were doing. And then eventually, by the time I was there, it was venture funded, but yeah. I have to admit, I applied to Mapbox like as the first place I came out of after Hack Reactor, and they contacted me right away. And my like, I remember my cover letter was... Uh, mostly about like the maps in Lord of the Rings and I was obsessed with them. And I, I even remember being like, they're going to so cool. love this cover letter. And of course it did. It was a great cover letter. Um, but the role they wanted me for was like more of a like sales engineer type role I see. Uh, because I had like more of a BD background and everything. And so I was like, I kind of like, I just did this whole boot camp thing. I need to give it an actual shot. Yeah. But yeah, I, it, for me, it did feel like a special company seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. I have a question about that's more like graphic specific. You mentioned the triangles thing. Can like can you explain everything's a triangle? What that meant? Sure. So like um the smallest unit of like shape that you can build other things out of is a triangle, right? Because like you can't you can't build uh multi dimensional things out of lines. Um they wouldn't have any like area, right? So like okay. you can but you can make any shape out of triangles including 3D shapes, you can, like, make a, a 3D. Okay, and you can't do it out of a circle? Uh, you could, okay, sorry. You could build things out of circles, but then you have infinite vertices. So you want, like, the least number of vertices because uh, the GPU has to run, like, a vertex shader on every vertex, so you want, like, minimum vertices. Okay. Um, so you make, like, a triangle, and then you connect it. You, like, make a bunch of triangles that make up your shape, and then the GPU runs a couple of special programs on those. Is this why Star Fox looks like for super nintendo looks like all triangles everywhere probably probably yeah okay. I, I don't know you don't know Star Fox. okay i actually i did play Star Fox a little bit when i was a kid because i'm an old brother but i don't remember it that well okay you should look I, it's literally just flying triangles oh, cool. <laughs> and people's yeah. minds were blown <laughs> yeah it's probably probably because of the graphics limitations got it this is back in the day when you could render 10 triangles yeah and well i remember this thing had the super fx chip chip in it 
And it's like literally, it was like, this makes your Super Nintendo even better. And I was like, I have to get that, obviously. And you put it in, and then there's just like triangles everywhere, and it was awesome. It was 3D. Do you know the story of the, the Super FX chip? No. Are you the one who told me about this? No. I mean, people are just going to have to look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. I won't yeah. do it justice. But it was like a couple of scrappy guys who didn't know what they were doing and um, managed to design this chip just because they really wanted to. I mean, the chip is starting up. Yeah. Uh, and then there was this like, whole dramatic thing of this business taking off, uh, license with Sony, and um, then, oh, was it Sony, Nintendo? This is Nintendo. Nintendo. Super Nintendo. Um, and then uh, them being betrayed or something. It's just like a really dramatic story. We'll find the article. In the yeah. To, like, I have the same thing with uh, that book, Soul of a New Machine. Have you, either of you oh, guys the read Tracy that? Theater book, yeah. Yeah, this is sweet. It's like, a, it's like a story of this company in Boston that's doing, like, not personal computers, so, like, pre-Steve Jobs type stuff, but, like, micro computers that might fit in this room or something. <laughs> and they gave some task to an intern. I, of course, I don't remember the task. Yeah, I know, I know the But story. it's, like, look it up it's like this is literally impossible. There's, like, no way to do this. And the intern's like, oh, I got it. And he does, the intern doesn't know that it's impossible and then, of course, figures out. Well, yeah, yeah. it was like the it was, uh, they were trying to design a CPU, and the intern was like, "Why don't we just build an emulator?" And so they're like emulating the entire machine, and everyone thought it was crazy, but no one told them. Uh, <laughs> so we just did it. <laughs> and it looks okay. like a story. Yeah. So, uh, like, what is it about graphics that makes you like it so much? <clears throat> um, I like that it's really. It's like very low level, but it also has like very visual results. Mm -hmm. It's really satisfying to see your work like in crazy graphics form, like on your screen. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also really satisfying, like connecting the logic of like actual shapes and not just uh, like if logic gates and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. 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 And like you can make really cool looking stuff out of math. It's really fun. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I, that makes sense. Uh, did you have, like, the math stuff, at least for me, would feel like an area of, like, weakness and, like, especially compared to some of these other people who did study this stuff, like, what have you been doing to augment that, if anything? Totally. So, actually, um, I I started at, uh, or on this rendering engine in Mapbox a while ago, and I, like, felt like I did okay for a while, and the one big, like, black hole of, of graphics where you actually need to understand some math is linear algebra. Mm-hmm. But if you have a rendering engine that's, like, pretty much already set up, then you can, like, sort of ignore that for most of it um, and just, like, trust that, like, it will project everything correctly. And it did. And so I, like, didn't know it for a long time and then I actually took the math class here at Bradfield and one of the topics was linear algebra. And I was like, oh, cool, I want to know about this. Um, and I feel like a lot of people hate linear algebra because they took it in school. I never took it in school. And I only learned it, like, out of necessity. Mm-hmm. And um, there's this great YouTube series um, on a channel called Three, three Blue, One Brown. Three Blue, One Brown. Yeah. That explains linear algebra I went through. And it was so cool that, like, now I feel like I understand what's going on. And I, like, gave a talk at a tech conference about it because mm-hmm. I was so excited about it. I was like, look at this cool math thing I learned about. And everyone's like, what? <laughs> yeah. This is very weird. That's awesome. Okay. I need, I need to, because it feels like linear algebra has so many applications. Like, obviously, now, like, all the deep learning stuff seems to be using it too. Yeah, it definitely feels like something I wouldn't want to know about if I didn't need to know about it. And then, like, as soon as you have an application for it and it um, makes sense in some context, it's amazing. Really? Yeah. It's great. I mean, everyone should learn linear algebra this way. When you have a strong reason to learn it. Yeah, when you get a reason to learn it. I mean, that's that's why it was created in the first place. People were trying to solve actual problems. And then we treat that as a foregone conclusion. And we're like, oh, this is very important for lots of other future things that you'll possibly do five years from now and so learn it as an 18 year old yeah and uh it's hard to like keep that carrot in front of your face yeah and i imagine when you're learning it in college they're just like okay here's how to multiply a matrix and like do this 500 times for homework yeah but, yeah yeah like i have no idea how to multiply a matrix i forgot <laughs> but it doesn't matter yeah it's computers are fun. i wish that all like all math was like that so, like i remember going through calculus in high school and like i was doing this stuff and writing those squiggly marks and have I, like I had no idea what any of it meant. And it'd be awesome if, like, when you're calculating like an integral, and I'm probably even getting this wrong. <laughs> if you're like, there's like a jug of water or something, and you're trying to calculate the volume under it or something like, like if you actually had the teacher gave you problems that needed to be solved by this thing in the real world, almost like an engineering hands-on type thing. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I mean, we kind of retrofit these stories onto teaching calculus. Yeah. But, and it feels contrived. Um, but if you genuinely wanted to do something, if you're genuinely trying to solve a problem, and you discovered that you needed calculus for it, you'd learn calculus. Yeah, like, I think if you were calculating, like, the volume of the jug of water professionally, then you'd be really excited. But if you're, like, a student and they're like, look at this jug of water, you'd be like, I, I <laughs> No, but, like, I remember, like, what if it was, like, a diehard three or four scenario where, like, there's, like, a bomb that might go off and you have to, like... <laughs> you would be really happy to know calculus. Yeah. That's true. Uh, you could make a game out of it. <laughs> so. My teachers, obviously, did. I loved my calculus teacher, but it was, uh, it was not practical. You should learn graphics, and then you can make a game for calculus. That's a good idea. Have yeah. you made any games? No. <laughs> Do you like games? Yeah, I like games. Um, I don't like, I'm not, like, a, a big gamer. Do you keep graphics like strictly at work now? Like, versus, like, like are you doing Pretty much. Evil? Every now and then yeah. I get excited about something, but uh, I mostly, like, outside of work, I don't, I don't really code. Yeah. I like, a dog, I make pottery. That's good, yeah. I keep plants alive, I have some friends. Okay. Yeah. But you've been doing, like, uh, speaking things? Uh, I've done a couple public speaking engagements, okay. yeah. And yeah. they were graphics related? So the first... The first two were like not my choice. I was, it was at Mapbox, and both in both cases, someone kind of like dropped out a spot of a spot, and they were like, "Hey, Lauren, you should give this talk." And I was like, "I have no idea what I'm talking about." Both of those, actually, the first one was graphics related, but it was two months into my first job, and I really have no idea like what I was talking about at all. And I, my coworker was there, and I sort of like recited a lot of things that I knew that generally our, our rendering engine did, but. Um, Afterwards, he was like, that was really good. Like, there were a couple things that were wrong, but I was like, that's <laughs> <was pretty> good. <laughs> and then the second one was about routing. It was, again, like, someone dropped out, and they were like, you should give that talk. And he was, the person who dropped out was, like, a PhD from this German university. It's in the I fill, fill a spot about routing. So those two were, like, bad, but they were motivating enough to want to do good public speaking. Um, and so, I think... The next one after that was um, was about graphics yeah. at Mapboxes, like at our user conference, and it's about how we render maps. And I really knew like everything about that rendering engine in and out of that point. And I practiced my talk a lot, and it went really well, and it was great. And then the last one was um, about linear algebra at a JavaScript conference. So, what do you what are your takeaways from this uh, public speaking things? Like practicing, obviously. Practicing is huge. Yeah. Also, like public speaking is great because at tech conferences, because it's like a free way to travel to another country, so it's like actually <laughs> a good idea. And I feel like it's it's really satisfying to. Um, I feel like it's like it's like eating my vegetables. Like you don't really want to do it, but then it's really good for you um, to learn how to speak in front of people, and uh, it feels really good to to give a good presentation. So yeah, practice a lot, keep practicing, um, and that, I found that like when I practice so much that. When I actually gave it, I like didn't couldn't like didn't really have to think about it. It went really well. Yeah, was it uh, like a live Q and A type thing? Uh, no, I think let's see. I think at one of them they had questions afterwards, okay. but just for like five minutes. Because otherwise, then you're just you're up there, you're giving your talk, and no one asks any questions. So like you have the stage, you have the totally. live, yeah. yeah. You're kind of in control. That's cool. Yeah, and then the other one where they didn't have a live Q and A, they had like a question room afterwards, so you go to talk to the speaker, and a couple of people came and they were like, "Oh, cool! I want to talk about linear algebra. That was cool." Yeah. Uh, so have you, what's your public speaking experience? I haven't done a whole bunch. Yeah, maybe I should. Um, I, I I feel like being in the classroom, I get to rant as much as I would like, <laughs> um, but yeah, it doesn't scale. Yeah, I have to rant at twenty students at a time. Um, what about you? I did way too much of it. It was like my previous job was doing business development, which was like oh, yeah. sales. And I I did public speaking all – I lived in London for a while. I was like traveling all over giving this talk. And this was a talk from – that basically they wanted the CEO founder to be giving this talk, but he couldn't be a hero. So I'm giving someone else's <laughs> speech, making these prognostics. Like a sales pitch? Yeah. Okay. It was like a sales pitch, but it was also this inspirational thing about the future of education where since the dawn of – my first my first thing at this job was coming up with a uh, slide – that showed access to education for humanity since the dawn of man. <laughs> and I was like, nice. okay, uh, how am I going to get this data? Yeah, you got it. And the thing was, which was like this guy, Marshall McLuhan had this thing where like each, uh, there were a couple of major revolutions in education, like the academy, the printing press, compulsory education. And then the fourth was our company. And <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I began this speech and like people, people loved it. They ate it up. 
but at a certain point, like that's almost why I kind of wanted to get into something else because I was like, I'm just I'm talking someone else's talk. I'm not actually building the thing I'm doing, which is a big motivation for me to like do engineering. And I like to segue into like your backstory, like what were you doing prior to saying like, oh, I want to go to this boot camp and try this new thing? Uh, so I went to boot camp actually like eight months after I finished college. Um, I got a job in between and I stayed there for six months. <laughs> And I immediately knew it was not right for me. I was doing UX design at a public sector focused agency in DC. Um, so much like the parent company of, of Mapbox. And uh, we were like designing websites for government agencies and nonprofits. And it's like an incredibly tedious process because the approvals process is so long and like everything's super bureaucratic. And actually like when I left, I was on, staffed on two projects and one was set to launch in like April and one was set to launch that summer, I think. And the first one launched two years later and the second one launched four years later. And I would like go back to their websites to see if they launched <laughs> but they're like big government agencies. And so there's just like this insane approval process. But I also felt like um, it was like not my not the best use of my skills. Like I wasn't I didn't feel like I was I didn't feel like that company really cared that much about great UX design or like maybe not the company so much as our clients. And we also had these like grumpy old men developers and they were just like rude and like not that smart. And I was like, I could do that job better. And so I, I came here. That's cool. Okay. So you saw engineers doing their thing and you were like, I could do that. Yeah. And actually when I started at school, I intended to major in electrical engineering because I wanted to build robots and at um, Duke the engineering curriculum is like the first two classes you take are math and uh, like an intro engineering class that's actually like a coding class. It's a MATLAB class. And so I did really well in the MATLAB class, even though I never went to class. So I should have seen the writing on the wall and just done computer <laughs> science. And I did so terribly in my math class. I got a D in multi calculus. So I decided I had oh to drop God, out of the engineering yeah. school. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, it was really bad. So I studied public policy and art instead. But I think like I, I should have known that early on that I should have done coding and then... Um, it was like nice to realize that it wasn't too late. Yeah, it's it's like nice that you're able to like recover from something like that because I feel like a lot of people haven't been able to, and it sucks to have that first class in the whole sequence be the sort of like weird gate for yeah. everything else that's <laughs> awesome about being an electrical engineer or being a computer science major to have this weird annoying like maybe in like the analog in pre med is like uh, organic chemistry or something where it's just this like weird horrible <laughs> thing that people like I can't get through it and then I don't become an awesome doctor so. It, 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 it's it's really cool that you're able to like come around that, but it would have been great if that somehow could have happened earlier. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about computer science is that you you don't need a fancy degree to do it, whereas like if you miss pre med, you really have to start over from like way early on. Yeah. Um, but but I guess part of the reason I like kind of got there eventually was uh, partly through college. I taught myself like HTML and CSS, mm-hmm. um, and I didn't really dig into JavaScript, but I still felt like pretty proficient with computers, so I felt comfortable trying that. Yeah. So you're sitting at this agency thing. Um, you saw people who did not inspire you, I guess. <laughs> totally, yeah. Uh, you felt like you, you crushed them. them. Yeah. But um, what was the like? What was the reason that you wanted to be better than them, but in, in that kind of role? Like, what was it about the role of a software engineer that seemed more appealing? Um, that's a good question. It's a long time ago, so <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess. I felt like I uh, I liked writing HTML and CSS. Like I liked figuring out computer stuff and like making websites. Um, <clears throat> and I just assumed that that the rest of it was fun. That like the actual programming part would be fun. And I wanted to move to California, so it was like a good excuse to move to San Francisco. Um, my brother is an engineer, so I kind of was like vaguely familiar with how well he liked his job. I guess. Nice. And then, so you came here, you did Hack Bride. Uh, mm-hmm. How was the process of assessing the market and finding a, a good first job? <clears throat> yeah, this is also like an area where I can't give good advice because in 2014 it was so different than it is now. Mm-hmm. But it was 2014 and I, it was like <clears throat> the Wild West for, for like jobs out of boot camps. Mm-hmm. Like nobody really knew anything about people coming out of boot camps and they were willing to take a chance on you. And I think now it's kind of harder to get that first job. But at the time, I um, the structure of Hackbrite was like five weeks of 
lectures and fair programming and then five weeks of working on your own project. And I got pretty lucky there in that my teacher was like, um, he was the first teacher that kind of started the school, whereas now I think everybody's kind of been bought by big education for profit companies and like it's it's pretty um pretty uniform in the way they do things. But at the time my teacher was like, make whatever project you want and then I told him the project idea and he was like, I think that'd be a great idea for somebody else, but I think you're gonna finish that in three days. So like pick something that'll take you five weeks. <laughs> and so I wrote a routing engine, um, like a map routing engine. And <clears throat> that also was like really lucky because somebody at Mapbox was following me on Twitter because we had a mutual friend who like told him I was working on a map project. And so I like, tweeted about my map project and then I had an interview at Mapbox that week and uh, had an offer like the next week. <laughs> so that was so lucky. And it was again, 2014. And then I, I interviewed a couple other companies too and had another offer in hand from like a, an established tech company and I was deciding between the two. And I was like, kind of agonizing about that because the the other company I would know exactly what team I was on and what I was going to work on and I was like soul searching and I was like this one company I would know exactly what to work on and like who my manager was and this other company they would say like wander the woods from Twitter. Yeah. and like find your own answers and my friends were like but that's just like that sounds like you like wander off into the woods and like figure it out uh, which is true so I, I paid map box you did a map routing project no less yeah and you would go to do that later yeah. yeah, actually, and so, like, when I started at Mapbox, they were like, what do you want to work on? And I was like, I think it'd be so cool to work on, on routing stuff. And they were like, okay, so the guy who runs that team has this, like, snotty PhD from Germany. What else do you want to work yeah, on? Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually that guy left, and they were like, anyone can do routing. Go for it. Awesome. Like, routing is, like, pathfinding or something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the project that I built in my boot camp was, like, a... A running route generator because I moved here from BC where it's flat and I was a runner and here mm-hmm. it was super hilly so I was writing a program to find like the, a flat running route. Did it find the wiggle? Um, I never looked for the wiggle because I was like looking from searching from where I was living at the time. Yeah. But uh, it was it's like a weird program because the goal of a running route is to like end up in the same place you started. So actually, the optimal route is to not go anywhere. So it's like kind of kind of hacky, but uh, it was alright. That's my kind of running, actually. It's just like really kind of rat <laughs> To not go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was 2014 when you, Charlie, also. I did 2015. Okay. So, like, I guess boot camps were kind of a thing or, like, becoming more of a thing. I was Hack Reactor, like, either 25 or 35. I have no idea. Oh, wow. But it was still, like, to the point where when I was doing my job search, like, I didn't have Hack Reactor. I guess I did have Hack Reactor on it, but it was, like, almost like, you can put it on your resume, but maybe you shouldn't put it on your resume and you should just like like list cool projects that you've built in this thing. Yeah. Because people don't understand it and there's still like implicit bias that you have a quote unquote non-traditional background. And I think that's gotten better. And that from at least like anecdotally what I've seen, like a lot of the schools are so focused now on like job placement that there's like funnels and then a lot of people end up going to places where there's already alumni, which you guys ended up hiring at Mapbox other boot camp grads. Yeah, we yeah. did. We hired um, several other yeah, so it sounds like like companies that have seen the light and had mm-hmm. success there tend to be where people end up. Yeah, I think it varies a lot by company. And then like some companies also have these apprenticeship programs set up, which seem like a good sort of like pathway in, but um, I felt lucky to have started in, at a time where they were like, do whatever job you want. Yeah. So um, how do you like how do you see the next stage of your career? Like is it digging in and like sinking your teeth more into like graphics related stuff. Have you like considered things like becoming it, like now that you've tasted what engineering management is like having a manager, presumably at Figma, like have you ever considered that route? Like where are you thinking about navigating? That's a good question. I have no idea. This is like the existential dread question. I don't know. I I feel like I'm not a huge planner and so Mm -hmm. far everything's worked out fine. So I feel fine like continuing down this road of like, doing my job well and learning stuff and then eventually I'll see something I, I want to do and maybe yeah. maybe that's management okay um, I'm not sure yeah yeah it sounded like I'm like funneling towards management I'm not I just was using that as like eventually it seems like there is this like choice that a lot of like ICs have to make yeah it is it is like yeah. a big question that I think everybody considers yeah like if I if I am to stay in this industry do I have to become a manager yeah no but if you can find a company where you're doing cool stuff that you love that also is some, like seemingly like a viable business. That's so awesome. Cause we've talked about this all the time. Like so many companies are just like 
database front ends for like selling a random thing. But like if you find a company that's like doing something like weird and novel, like map making mm-hmm. or uh, you know, Figma, like build basically it seems like you're taking like a super heavy application and just putting it on the web and making it like just as fast as running Photoshop, which must be like crazy difficult to do. Yeah, there are some really smart people at Figma who built up before I got there. But. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is your opportunity to take all the credit. But. Yeah. <laughs> well. I can't do that. Someone there is going to listen. Um, do you guys, speaking of becoming a manager or not, did you watch the, listen to the uh, John Carmack Logan interview? Oh, no, not yet. Yeah. You should. I mean, you both should. Uh, not for Rogan, obviously, but for uh, anything that Carmack says. Like, one of the things that he was talking about is his decision to stay as a, as a programmer. He's the CTO of Oculus, as you guys might know. Um, as the CTO, you would expect him to do some management, and he does, he does absolutely none. Uh, he's just decided that, uh, and he says explicitly, I, I may have had more of an impact if I sucked it up and did management, but I wouldn't enjoy it as much. So I decided at some point in my career to uh, just make sure that I'm doing a lot of programming. So he's involved in a strategy and things like that, and he does less programming than usual, but uh, at his level, he's still cutting code. He tries to do 60-hour weeks. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, actually, both of my companies have had, like, very different styles of CTOs, which I feel like is really helpful to see and, like, realize that there's all kinds of different ways that you can be an engineering leader. Um, one, my current company, like, the CTO is super, super hands-on in the code. Um, he's coding all the time and doesn't doesn't manage. And then uh, at my old company, he was, like, not so much a manager, but he was sort of, like, a like everybody's mentor kind of guy, and, like, he would just jump in and help where he needed, but he wasn't architecting any, like, projects from a technical perspective. It was like architecting the technical side of the company, sort of. That's cool. Yeah, with Carmack, um, because you're so into graphics, have you heard of this book, Masters of Doom? Mm -hmm. Carmack was like one of like the founding software engineers of the people who made like Doom and Quake and all this stuff. And like, I think he invented like all kinds of like crazy rendering things that now every single game uses. And this book is just the two, like their startup story and their like, like, uh, kind of a, what I would consider like disastrous lifestyle that like allowed them to produce these incredible <laughs> things stuff, where they're yeah. like all living in the same house. Mm-hmm. Carmack's like surviving on Coca-Cola and pizza for like three days at a time, but like emerges with this incredible rendering engine. It's, a, it's an awesome read. Cool. He, he would yeah. like, after each game, he would just throw out everything that he'd done, go off by himself for like a month and show up with a new rendering engine from scratch. That's and, wild. Yeah, and then John Romero, his um, his partner, uh, the game designer, would like find an appropriate game for the engine, like for the features of the engine. <laughs> but wow, yeah. it's not a lifestyle that I aspire to. But I'm glad no. somebody does it. I I like watching it and seeing it. Yeah. Like I, uh, I'm talking about the show Halt and Catch Fire, which is like building like a computer. Oh, yeah. Have you seen this? Uh, I watched the first like half of the first season. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of fizzling around there too, but like. I see that and I'm sort of like getting this nostalgic craving for like, oh God, it'd be so good to like be in this office right here and just be doing that. And that's like, no, wait, it's like, <laughs> I like pottery or whatever. Yeah. 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 Do you like pottery? I do. Well, I'm making a, uh, I'm painting this like terrapin thing. There's this place in Noe Valley and they have like, you go and you, it's like a, like a kiln type place and you can go and you can bring food and stuff. And I, it's like a very intricate terrapin that I've been painting. And like each little piece of the shell is a different color. And every time I go, there's like 35 minutes left uh, before they close. So I've gone three times and it's still not done. What is a terrapin? It's like a turtle. Okay. It's like a water, I guess I was going to say a water turtle. But it's pottery, but, you're painting it. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like white. And yeah, then yeah. they're going to put it in a kiln and it's yeah. going to become shiny. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> yeah. What, what are, you, uh, sculpt- are you sculpting or... Uh, I've been doing a lot of wheel throwing. What so does that mean? It's like there, there's that spinning wheel and you put a lump of clay on it and then over the span of like 15 minutes it turns into a pot. It's pretty cool. So you, what have you made so far? Oh, you made some pots so far. A lot of pots, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, do you have a wheel or do you go to a place? No, I go to a place. Okay. And I take classes in there. That's sweet. So I'm making some like pitchers and some teapots. Um, it's pretty fun. I just had a 
an image of your entire house just full of pot plants, like unnecessarily, or even just empty pots all around the place. Yeah, my image, my my house is full of plants in pots that I bought that I plan to replace with pots that I make, and with shitty pots that I've made myself <laughs> that I don't know what to do with because they're not good enough to like show, but they're just in my house. But they're getting better. Your friends probably know like what they're getting as like housewarming gifts and totally. gifts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of pots. I'm getting to the point. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's sweet to like make this stuff, and then it's like there's there's always this point, maybe especially in San Francisco, where you're like, you should sell the pots you make, and it's like, no, that would completely ruin yeah. everything I like about this. Yeah, totally. I have like watered in my our studio though, and people like come to try it for, like a one time class or something. And there will be inevitably somebody who gets really into it. And then the teacher will be like, what do you do for a living? Like, it's the one person who stays after class. And like, I really want to get this right. And that person is always like, I'm a software engineer. And they're like, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's like awesome to have a hobby that's like completely unrelated to what you're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's likely that I could like progress more in my career if I, if my hobby was also graphics, but like, it's fun to, to turn that off. When you were doing the, like, three blue, one brown, or whatever the correct way to say that is, are you doing that at work? Or are you like, oh, I'm going to, like, burn the midnight oil to learn the linear algebra? Like, what, how did work facilitate the, like, active learning stuff? No, that was, like, a during Bradfield. Um, okay. So it was, like, at, at nights, you know, I would spend, like, a week and watch the series. It's pretty quick. Okay. And then every watched it other times. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what sort of workplace facil like, a lot of these places facilitated the figuring it out but then if your like manager walks by and you have like a textbook out and you're like writing things on index cards that probably their <laughs> tolerance would be stretched even though they like want to facilitate that so it does require some like after hours yeah yeah, yeah the learning like linear algebra just for the sake of learning it is separate from like yeah i don't know scratching out linear algebra or like watching the video for the one thing you need to figure out yeah i think unfortunately the assumption is that if you're an engineer supposed to know everything already that like you know if you're a researcher you get to step back a little bit and figure things out but uh somehow as an engineer you're supposed to already know this thing and if you don't that's on you and you spend your weekends learning a new framework or something but um i guess you just have to hope, hope for a good manager yeah yeah I think some you, managers are a lot more tolerant of that than others or you just choose to learn the things that they're really into <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. yeah do you think there's something, is there like another team, this is like, we don't need to say this, but like, is there things at Figma where you're like, I want to work on that? Or do you feel like you've navigated yourself towards this like ideal state? No, yeah, I'm working on the thing that I want to be working on. Okay. Remi like remind kind of, me of what that is again. Uh, I work on the prototyping feature. So like the sort of presentation mode um, rendering engine of our, of our... Okay, so when someone's showing off something? Yeah, so you okay. can like design stuff and then... Um, Maybe there's like a bunch of frames and you want them to connect to each other and like the part where you click things. Yeah. Uh, so then you show that, but you click a button and it opens a separate window and that's um, the rendering engine that powers that like presentation mode is what I work on. And when you think about like working on that, do you see, there's probably like milestones and things like that, but is there a point, like something like that is never really done. So like, how do you, how are you doing like goal setting or like, I want to get this thing to this point and then I'll feel like I'm ready for like some new challenge. Are you just like, oh, I'm just going to take the constant steady flow of like every new feature for this thing. And maybe a related question is like, how are you, as someone who's like really interested in this and working on it, what sort of like input do you have into like the roadmap for what's being built? Yeah. Um, that was a lot of questions. Yeah, I know. That was rambling. <laughs> um, I guess it's it's like fun to work on a on a product where the people who use the product really like it. Like it's it's not like a you know a data warehouse or like a marketing CRM or something. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but like the people who use Figma are like very vocal about what they like about it and what they what they want improved and stuff. So there's always a lot of stuff to build, uh, which is fun. And um, yeah, I of course we're never done, and like we'll always have more things to do and. Uh, Basically, like, what, what you can do in Figma prototypes should be, like, what you can do on the web anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, always expanding as well. So I think certainly we'll never be done. Um, as to the, like, roadmap setting, I think uh, we sort of do it collaboratively with, like, our whole team, with input from our product managers mm -hmm. and our product designer. All of our designers at Figma use Figma. So, like, good designer input as well. Yeah. Um, but we also, like, 
you know, we hear about things on Twitter and we like hear about things through MPS. And so we, we kind of uh, all are tend to be on the same page intrinsically about like what, what people really want. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Oh, yeah. If you have no advice for us, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah, my advice is just do it if you really want to do it. Sweet. Make sure you really want to do it. Check out graphics. Check out linear algebra. Is yeah, watch this linear algebra series, but also like have, have a reason to. Yeah. I guess. Try some graphics. Okay. Build a video game to teach people calculus using the volume of a jug. Yeah, I'm putting that on my like I'm that. putting it on my desk. <laughs> Uh, like, I'm just kind of embarrassed that's probably not even what an integral is, but I, I don't know. yeah, I don't remember it. no, you're totally right. Like, okay, really okay, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, or like geometry, where it's like if you had to like measure some distance of a yard or something, or like I don't know, there's all kinds of things you could like put children outside and make them figure it out, and they're just not doing so. Maybe that can be my, <laughs> that can be my life goal. I don't know. Where can people find you and follow you and uh, learn more about your graphics related work? Um, I have a Twitter account that's like semi recent. I, I don't think I use it that much, but it's L Badoric. That's where you can see the uh, crying animation that I was talking about. That's true. It's pretty awesome. I used to actually, when I worked on, when I worked at Mapbox, I worked on an open source render, so it felt like it was like fair game to tweet everything I was ever working on. So I tweeted a lot of like crazy map graphics. I tweet less uh, crazy design graphics now, but occasionally like a crying face. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, we're done. <laughs> Thanks, Alex.